Goldman and first person of the Jewish faith to lie in state in the capital of the United States. And we want to make sure the election is honest, and I'm not sure that it can be. I don't I don't know that it can be weighing the stakes, the ballots. That's a whole big scam. As the president cast doubt on the election process by mounting that kind of fraud at scale would be a major challenge for an adversary. The director of the FBI gives Congress the bureau's assessment. This as more protests erupt in American cities in the wake of charges around the death of Breonna Taylor. All this and more tonight on... Closer than it's ever been I feel the swell of anticipation As we believe anything can happen I feel it in my bones, I feel it on my skin Ooh, oh. Heaven's closer than it's ever been let it rain. Come on, are you ready for the rain? Come on, let me hear you ready for the rain. So let it rain. Let it rain. Come on, let's declare heaven fall. Come on, say. Let heaven fall, let heaven fall. We want it all. Let heaven fall, let heaven fall. Come on, say your freedom. Your freedom. Your joy. Your mercy, your hope, we want it all. Let heaven fall, let heaven fall. Come on. Every sorrow will drown in the joy of heaven. Every stronghold will break in the healer's presence. Yes, Lord. I feel it in my bones, I feel it on my skin. Yeah, yeah. Come on, heaven, heaven's closer than it's ever been. Come on, let it rain. Let heaven fall, let heaven fall. We want it all. Let heaven fall, let heaven fall. Come on, say your freedom, your joy, your mercy, your hope. We want it all. Let heaven fall. Come on, come on, Father, 
porch ready Hey Open the windows All over this place We cry out Hey Open the heavens Over this place Open the heavens Over this place Open the heavens Over this place Let it rain Let it rain See, open the heavens Over this place Open the heavens Over this place Come on, make it your declaration Come on Open this is something that we got to take by faith tonight amen you i want to let you know and remind you your prayers are being heard amen? amen and i make a declaration that god is moving in the places of the unseen he's moving with the love so deep come on we might not see it right now but what we're about to do is about to come on go all over the country all into the white house come on into your house into your neighbor's house into the church house Come on, we don't see it right now in the natural, but in the supernatural, he responds. Amen. Amen. your heart for so many years have you been hoping that things would have changed by now have you cried all the faith you have through so many tears don't forget the things that he has done before remember he can do it all once more. Hey. It's like the brightest sunrise Waiting on the other side of the darkest night Don't ever lose hope, oh don't ever leave Maybe you just haven't seen it, just haven't seen it yet You're closer than you think you are Only moments from the break of dawn All these promises are just up ahead Maybe you just haven't seen it just haven't seen it yet Waiting on the other side of the darkest 
this night Don't ever lose hope Hold on and believe Maybe you just haven't seen it Just haven't seen it Make a declaration. He is moving with love. Hallelujah for the victory. Good things are Come on, this is our declaration over America. Amen. Come on, let's declare it. Say, He is moving with love so deep. Hallelujah for the victory. Good things are coming even when we can't see it. We can't see it.
back. Now this is our declaration. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Come on. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop. Come on. Hey! Even when I don't see it, say Even when I don't see it, you work again Even when I don't feel it, you work again You never stop, you never stop working Come on, even when I don't see it Even when I don't see it, you work again Even when I don't feel it, you work again You never stop, you never stop working Hallelujah. 
Glory be to the name of the Lord. Can you just give him praise tonight? Raise your hands and thank the Lord, for he alone is worthy. He is the Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, dear folks, Jesus has been waiting before the foundations of the earth to come for this one moment to inhabit his bride. And here we are, the righteous remnant, standing before a holy God in reverent fear to repent of our sins this weekend, to call down the God of all heavens and earth, to rend the heavens and come and meet with us. We are praying for the outpouring of His Holy Spirit to come and join us here this weekend to watch a nation turn back to the ways and the will of God. Hallelujah. Give Him praise. He alone is able. He is worthy of the praise. Hallelujah. Tonight, I'm Kevin Jessup. I'm here with my lovely bride. She's the most beautiful, awesome woman in the world. Can you say amen? <laughs> You know, we men are lucky because we have brides. And, and this weekend, we are the bride. We're praying for the Holy Spirit to come and inhabit us, to infiltrate this place. We're asking God to come and meet with us. And I believe that He's already here because you've all brought Him with you. So give yourselves a hand tonight for showing up. Hallelujah. The entire Bible is a simple story about a father looking for a virtuous bride for his son. Well, I'm here to say tonight that we've all come to Washington, D.C. to say one thing. Let the redeemed say so! Hallelujah! God is still on the throne. He's a big God. He's a way maker. He's the light in the darkness. And we thank God for it. I just wanted you to see my bride because for the last six years, as we've been praying and believing God for this night by faith, that He is ever faithful, step by step. He leads us, He guides us, He comforts us, He counsels us. And without my sweet wife, we couldn't be here tonight. So I want you to just give it up for this wonderful intercessor, woman of God, full of the word. My rock, my pillar, my lovely wife, Donna. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank you, Donna. Praise God. Now I want to bring two very special people on the platform with me just for a moment before we get underway tonight. And tonight's going to be a very powerful night. This man right here is Pastor Phil Enlow, pastor of Harvest Chapel in Venice, Florida. And this young man over here is Juan Pinzone. I met him seven years ago, itinerating for Reinhard Bonnke at the time. And Juan and I, Juan looks like he's 12, but he's 23. That's true. He's a handsome guy. And so Juan's been working with us. He's a, he's a special guy and he's come alongside my right hand. But 40, uh, it was 52 years ago, at the age or I, I can't do the math anymore, but at the age of 12, I went on a missionary trip to Mexico, and I got saved in a Mexican prison witnessing to the Mexican prisoners. And this man headed up the tour. And then, four years later, when my life took a left-hand turn, I ran away from home, and I joined a gang, and there was a moment in that initiation of that gang that I'll never forget, I cut my hand and I bled blood on a piece of paper with my family's names. I then burned that paper in the ashes and the blood of my hand, vowing to be with that gang. And four years later, at the age of 16, sitting in a prison cell with no hope, I remembered the words that my mother said. When you get into a crisis, there's one thing that you can always do, and that is to call upon the name of Jesus, because when you call upon his name, he's there. And in that jail cell that night, I called upon the name of Jesus. And I said, oh, Jesus, I've wandered from you from the day of my salvation. Will you renew yourself to me? And I had a, a, a vision in that jail cell that I'll never forget. The Lord came into that jail cell that night as I was facing some terrible sentencing the next day. And he said that gang initiation 
was a cheap imitation of what I did for you because I actually spilt my blood on Calvary's Hill. I wrote your name in the book of life and I'm going to fill you with the fire of the Holy Ghost to preach my word. And at 16, I didn't know what that meant, but the schools didn't want me anymore because of the past records. And my mother, who told me to cry out to the name of Jesus, called Pastor Phil and said, four years ago, our son came back from Mexico, saved and on fire for God, and now his life is in danger. And for some unknown reason, Pastor Phil took me under his wing for two weeks. That two weeks turned into 10 years he made sure that I went to Bible school, and we traveled all around this globe preaching and witnessing the glory-saving salvation, the long arm of God that never stops pursuing us, and we praise God for it. I'm telling you, I remember the Chilean miners in that pit with no hope to get out. That was me, but God's long arm reached down as he did with those miners, and one by one, he pulled them out of that crazy man-made contraption, and we all watched as they came out safe and we, we hollered and screamed that they were safe. That is what God does. He reaches into a pit that we don't have any escape from and he pulls us out. And I'm so grateful to the Lord for his finished work on the cross. So tonight, as we go into the next generation, I'm going to ask my two brothers to pray with me because my pastor, whom I've known for over 50 years, who's been my mentor and spiritual father for all of these decades, and yet we have the Joshua generation here that's rising up. And I'm simply a bridge in the middle as we pass the thing from father to son and son to father. We are here this weekend to reinstitute, as Psalm 71:17 says. It says, from, uh, from my days of youth, you taught me your wondrous deeds. But even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me until I pass on your power to the next generation. And so this next Joshua generation that's coming up, we owe them an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And so we are here tonight to honor the next generation and yet honor the fathers of the faith that have led us this far. And so tonight I want to ask Pastor Phil and Juan Pinzone to both say a quick prayer over this. And, and I want you all to join us in prayer and thank God for his faithfulness into our lives. And the Word of God that says He'll never leave us or forsake us. We may leave Him, but He's a long-suffering, gracious, merciful God, and He lets us come back to Him. And I'm so grateful for that. Pastor Phil, lead us in a prayer tonight. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we call upon You to grace us with Your presence. We've come around the world in order for You to get glory and honor. Thank You for the vision that You gave to Kevin of this day and Donna, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have made it come into being what you have called them to do. So I pray, Lord, that you will bring us back in unity like you did in that upper room. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will pour out your spirit on all flesh like a mighty, roaring, rushing wind like you did in that upper room. I thank you, Lord, for the results of this gathering. And so I ask all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, we ask these things in your name. Amen. My God, we just stand here representing the Joshua generation, Lord. We want an encounter. We know that we need you, Father. And here today at the National Mall, we say, here I am, Father. And in this moment, we take up the calling that has been given to us. We take up the calling because we know that we need you, Father. And in this moment, I call upon the Joshua generation that is to stand before you and say, you are mine and I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, everybody. My name is Mondo. I want to take the next few moments to challenge you and encourage you. We all have been inspired by the words and the actions of men and women that risked it all and took a stand for their generation. The words of Martin Luther King Jr. inspire a nation to have a dream. The actions of Mother Teresa challenged all of us to never stop loving, hurting people. The preaching of the gospel of Billy Graham taught us to never compromise the message of the cross. The vision of Jim Baker to step out and pioneer Christian television 
changed the way we watch Christian television today. You have been called to change your generation and the future generations with the words and the actions and the vision that will not compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ for the future generations to come. The Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. Your words can change the lives of people in your community, in your neighborhoods, and even for your nation. As a former gang member of one of the most notorious gangs in East L.A., the words and actions of my sister, a young lady willing to risk her life and her reputation, changed my life. She stepped out of her comfort zone and used her words and took action. She asked me three of the most powerful questions that someone could ever ask me at that time in my life. She asked me, what if God is real? What if prayer works? What if you have a different destiny? And today, you can do the same. You can step out of your comfort zone and take action to change this generation, to inspire others, and to never, never compromise the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity right now to step out of our comfort zone so we can inspire and remind our generation that God is real, that prayer does work, and that we do have a different destiny. I want to thank you and remember, as my father, Jim Baker, reminded millions of people through Christian television, God loves you. He really does. There was a mass shooting that was planned targeting black kids at a school, a high school where my son attended. And due to hate and race, racism, they planned to kill all the kids that had a, a different skin color than theirs. And the threats to cleanse the hallways and create a Columbine number two were made on social media by two Caucasian students. When the police department was um, notified and entered into the home, one of the juveniles uh, did have five guns and ammunition. The introduction was made to Pastor Troy Martinez as a co-responder in our city. He provided a bridge for us as parents and victims. When it comes to communities of color, it's imperative to have co-responders to assist them before things get out of hand, when people's emotions are heightened, when people are angry, uh, maybe there's uh, you know distrust of law enforcement, the co-responders plays a vital role of keeping the peace. We were able, as a result of that bridge and that collaboration, to go back and forth to court safely, and we felt that the police department was involved in securing the safety of ourselves and our children. When police officers get to step aside from just making arrests, they start to understand that their policing strategies are actually growing within the community. The Metropolitan Police Department is totally used to, after all these years, of using pastors and ministers to reach out to different communities. It just happened. On days when we had court, there were at least five officers to provide an escort into the building. The incident was like a pressure cooker. You know, it was just boiling and festering and between the victims, our children and their friends. And it wasn't just at that school, it was their friends at other schools. Had we not had the, the relationships established between the community as well as the police officers that um, assisted, then uh, individuals in the community were ready to take matters into their own hands. Youth are watching us right now. They're actually looking for people with solutions. They're looking for people with facts about what's actually happening within our nation. Yes, police departments can be the facilitators to bring in co-responders from throughout the community. They help keep the peace so that police can do their job and the community can get the justice that they expect. If there were no co-responders in our situation, there would have been a race war. The template and model used to have co-responders paired with police officers to respond in difficult calls, a shooting, a homicide, racial tensions, especially if there's an officer involved shooting and people want answers immediately, rebuilding every city around peace. My name is Pastor Troy Martinez from Las Vegas, Nevada. 
And I would like to thank every single person that came out tonight and all those that are watching across the nation and across the world and simulcast and those that are here in attendance. And I just want to say I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ that 30 years ago he interrupted my life of sin and rescued me. And since then he has been given me a gift of reconciliation, which is the gift that he has given the Church of Jesus Christ. And that literally means to bring those that once were at enmity, to bring them back together in peace. And since then, I've been blessed with my wife, Sandra, four adult children and 11 grandchildren, because I had a praying mother that prayed when I didn't deserve it and still helped me. Since then, praying for mayors, governors, presidents, being to the White House, Department of Justice, and working directly with law enforcement to bring healing to the communities, no matter what color those communities are, no matter what's taking place, the church is relevant and valid. Three years ago, when I started partnering with Kevin Jessup and Rabbi Khan and the team, we had no idea that we would need this prayer and this message regarding police and community. It is so relevant today. How many know God is way ahead of us? Can I get an amen? But we need to take care of business. Jesus said, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go and reconcile with your brother and sister and then return to the altar of God. So we need to make sure that we reconcile no matter what level it's on to remove every form of misconception, hate, mistrust, whether it's towards the police, whether it's other people of different races, it doesn't matter. And I need to remind us that in the plains that when of Jericho, when the uh, Joshua, the military commander, was confronted with the mighty angel of God in the plain, and he drew his sword, and he stood there, and Joshua asked him a question. He said, who are you for? Are you for us, or are you for our enemies? And this mighty military angel of God said, I'm not for you, and I'm not for your enemies. I'm for God. I'm a, a mighty commander. I got power and authority. And that's what we need to understand, that it's going to be that we are returning to God, and there's only one side when it comes to salvation, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you believe that, give the Lord a big hand praise. The Lord has placed us strategically at this time. The church is the only thing that's going to rescue America from its sins. The church, the believers, every single one of us. Let me tell you about the return. The return is just like the kickoff in a Super Bowl. But we kick off and then we go back home to our own towns, our own city, our own family, our own neighborhood. And we begin to do the work of God. We are relevant in this culture and we need to take back the place and authority. Government can't do it for us. The police can't do it for us. The only one that's going to do it is when we get God inside of us motivated enough to say, this is what God has called us to do. Forty-five years ago, I was an unarmed teenager. And I ended up with a hole in my head from a 38. A few years later, the police shot my brother who was 15. He was also unarmed. And I could be up here today filled with hate. This happened in the streets of Los Angeles in the 70s. I could be here filled with anger. I could be here, you know, hating the police, hating the government. But I'm here filled with love because Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus is the one that will reconcile the police with the community. Jesus is our only hope. Uh, and that's what God wants to do. My wife is standing right over there when she was 19 years old uh, and pregnant with my first daughter. She was captured and put in a swamp truck at just 19 she was innocent didn't do nothing but let me tell you something she's standing here here we are in Washington DC how does that happen that happens when Jesus gets a hold of your life I had a chaplain 
from the L.A. County Jail, which I frequented often. It was my second home. But let me tell you, that chaplain, Chaplain Bob Mercado, he would tell me, God has a plan for you, Troy. Jesus can use you if you'll just let God use your life. And today, let me tell you something. Jesus is using people of God. He will use a sinner. We are sinners saved by grace. Can I get an amen? And God wants to use us now. But let me remind you, the same people that don't understand, they don't know Jesus. Uh, they're waiting for someone, someone to bring them the answer, someone to say, we don't hate you, uh, we love you. God isn't against you. God is not one side or the other. God is for everybody. Uh, it's the will of the Father that none should perish, uh, but all should come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you believe that, give the Lord a hand. Uh, let me tell you something. All my children, all my grandchildren were, were born in Las Vegas. Can anything good come out of Las Vegas? Yes, uh, something good can come out of Las Vegas. Uh, we have partners with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. When somebody's shot, uh, when somebody's injured, when there's racial tensions, uh, something's happened in the school, they call the people of God. They call the pastors. Uh, they call the preachers. Uh, they say, come and help us. Uh, we can't do this with a gun. We can't do this with a baby. But what we need is the Bible. We need Jesus. Uh, and when we show up, uh, there's a light uh, that drives out all darkness. Uh, so I'm here today as a living letter, a testimony of what God can do. Uh, take it home, friend. Let us return to God. Uh, let us return back to our communities. Uh, let's let's take uh, reach out to the drug addict. Uh, you're going to hear in a minute from Mike Lindell, an old dope fiend. Uh, but now let me tell you, we're going to start a new program and we're going to see it every single city in America because Jesus Christ uh, is the answer and we are returning to him with a fervency and a power and an authority. So in my head, I was like, okay, I'm going to accept Christ in front of everybody right now. Then I'm going to go home and snort drugs until I don't want to do them anymore. And that was my way of thinking. So I received Christ at the church. I went home neglected my daughter and put her in front of the TV. I remember I grabbed a hundred dollar bill. I always used a hundred dollar bill for some reason, pride or something. I chopped up my crystal meth, got it all smooth and powdery, and I snorted a big old line. And I held the bill and I looked up and I said, Jesus, if you're real like that pastor said, then you gotta take these drugs from me. Come into my life, come into my heart. And I just got quiet. I said, search me right now. Search my heart. Words that would describe my life. I would just say fun, crazy, and out of control. Wilding out. Partying, skateboarding, going to all different countries. Surfing, snowboarding, Tonga, Fiji, met with the king of Fiji. Working with a lot of different bands, slept with girls. Got introduced to cocaine, started shooting heroin. A lot of girls from the Deftones, Limp Bizkit, sex addiction. Acid and Hawaiian mushrooms. Every girl was out to burn me in 50,000 watts of sound system. Used them like pieces of meat for eight hours straight. She said, I love you, I wanna be with you, but I'm, I'm gonna get an abortion. I was losing friends that were dying, putting ecstasy, heroin, and coke in syringes and shooting it while smoking crack. Start over. If I were to personify addiction, he would be charming, charismatic, leader, silver tongue, it's got many to follow it. Dominant, not allowing attention to go anywhere else, promising better things. It's a better thing always around the corner. It's always something more sweet. Jesus, you gotta take these drugs from me. Search me right now, search my heart. Father, I felt so much fatherly love from, from heaven. And it was like, I don't condemn you. I love you. I love you. It was just love, love. And instantly, that love from God came into me. It was so powerful that the next day I threw away all my drugs. And uh, I quit corn. I was like, I'm quitting corn and I'm going to raise my kid. Because my kid, like I got the love from God coming to me and then it came out of me to my kid. It changed me. My heart was changed like that. And I was like, Janaya, daddy's going to be home with you all the time. I'm quitting my career. 
and her face lit up and she's like, for me? You know, she felt so special and uh, God used her to save me, to save her. It's when I'm in those moments and when I'm crying out in the desperation, God's working in that. And I don't always feel close to it. There are a lot of things I don't have answers for. You know, why am I still here? I've had to bury friends who I think are much better dudes than I could possibly be. They were kind and gentle and giving. And so I don't have those answers. I know that he loves me. I trust that he knows the plan that he set out for me. And so I'm comforted by that in those messy moments. That's where God's doing his biggest work, is in the mess. I'm not perfect. I don't have everything figured out. Completely rough around the edges, but I know that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life, and I'm gonna follow him in whatever he does in my life. This is Song of Solomon 8, 6, and 7a. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Five years ago, my mother got a phone call from the hospital saying that my brother was dying and that she needed to come to the hospital right away. What we didn't know is that he had gotten a hold of some bad drugs and he stopped breathing. The only reason that they called her was because his organs were shutting down and they knew he was going to die. We used the word of God to cancel every single negative word that had been spoken over my brother's life or written by the doctors. And everything that the doctor said that he would never do again, today he's doing. The problem is that many of those things that he was using drugs to heal in his heart. I've used so many other things. Education, accomplishments, money, status, all of it. I can imagine how it made God's heart feel when I saw my brother's heart dying, when I saw my brother's life and body dying. But I was doing the same thing with other things on my heart in the throne where only he was supposed to be. So today, we're going to stand in the gap for our nations and for ourselves, and ask the Lord that he would forgive us for placing things on the throne of our hearts that only he can be in. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, we repent right now in the name of Jesus for allowing other things to take your place in our heart. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus that you would forgive us. In the name of Jesus, we break agreement with every other thing that is set on the throne of our heart. And in the name of Jesus, we set you as the seal on our hearts in the name of Jesus. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name, take your place on our hearts once again. There is no one else that can take your place. No water, no anything can put the flame of God out. Lord, we ask you, send the fire of God from the fire of your heart down to our hearts and set our hearts ablaze once again. Many waters cannot quench the flame of your love on our hearts. Let your name and your glory fall in Jesus' name. I think my addiction was back to childhood. I was a cocaine addict since the mid-1980s. That switched to crack cocaine in the early 2000s. My self-worth just kept getting worse and worse. I drove into the My Pillow. God gave it to me in a dream. You know, I wanted to be able to walk down the streets and anything that anybody wanted in a pillow, My Pillow would have. We're going to make the biggest infomercial in history and it's going to change the world. That infomercial launched October 7, 2011, and I went from 10 employees to 500 employees in 40 days. In the spring of 2008, it was an intervention. I've been up for 14 days doing crack cocaine. Give me that phone. He says, I'm going to take a picture of you. He says, you're going to need it for that book you've been bragging about. And he says, we're not going to let you die on us. 
On January 16, 2009, God freed me from these and other addictions. I'm going to do this platform thing and I'm going to wake up in the morning and never have the desire for anything again. Never had a dream about it. I'd never look back. You ever see this guy with the pillows on Fox? Yeah. Mike Lindell. There's nobody on this planet I'd rather have my, as my president than Donald Trump. Be the most amazing president this country's ever seen in history. I see promises made and promises kept. I knew my calling, that God had chose me for this to help people. Are you ready? Are you kidding? I've been waiting for this my whole life. Thank you, Mr. President, for your call to action, when, which has empowered companies like MyPillow to help our nation win this invisible war. Now I wrote something off the cuff, if I can read this. Okay. <laughs> God gave us grace on November 8, 2016, to change the course we were on. God had been taken out of our schools and lives. A nation had turned his back on God. And I encourage you to use this time at home to get to home to get back in the word, read our Bibles and spend time with our families. Our president gave us so much hope where just a few short months ago, we had the best economy, the lowest unemployment and wages going up. It was amazing. With our great president, vice president, and this administration, and all the great people in this country praying daily, we will get through this and get back to a place that's stronger and safer than ever. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Please come on up. I did not know he was going to do that, but he's a friend of mine, and I, I do appreciate it. Thank you, Mike, very much. I remember that day like it was yesterday. <laughs> they, um, I want to tell you, though, that uh, my story, you know, we all have stories, and I'm going to tell you the longer version right now, but I wouldn't change a thing in my life if, it, if I wasn't where I'm at right now to be able to speak out for Jesus and help everybody get to the Lord, and, or to use my story for that. But my story, it begins that, you know, I was seven years old when my parents divorced back in the late 1960s, where divorces weren't common. So I was put into a school, and I was the only one in the school from a divorced family, so I, was, I, I would either show off or I wouldn't talk. I got, I, the devil put these lies into me that I'm not good enough or I don't fit in and all these things. And by the time my five-year class reunion came, I got there and everyone had, was graduating from college or they had uh, uh, started families or ex expanded their careers. Well, myself, I had worked at a grocery store in a drive-in movie theater and had dropped out of college in the first quarter. And uh, But I took over that class reunion and I started telling them these other things that had happened to me, like um, I had crashed my motorcycle on my way to go skydiving and I got back up and I got down there and my parachute didn't open. And or, or owing the mafia $20,000 for football bets and they come to my door to break my arms. And, and uh, so all these things, I took over this reunion. Well, then I got home that night in bed and I laid there and this deep sadness came over me that I wanted what they had, that it was a deep loneliness and a sadness. And I think, and I, you know, I can look back now and say where my, you know, I believe addiction comes from childhood wounds, fatherlessness, and you know, all these things that happened in our childhood. and. For me, then in the 1980s, I was introduced to cocaine. Well, then I could talk your ear off. Um, they, uh, I got, uh, it would mask pain. It would, um, it would um, um, give me false courage, all these things. And uh, if I, um, what, what happened then though, is I was a very functioning addict. I think all too many times people go, they think of an addict as someone in the streets. Well, it doesn't matter how many forks you eat with, addiction affects everybody. And just as, but I was a functioning addict for about 20 years, and um, on on the cocaine and alcohol and g compulsive gambling. Then it all turned to crack cocaine in the early 2000s, and that was very hard to run two parallel lives. But I um, I started I was I was always an entrepreneur, so there was another parallel track. But I had I owned a bar for 13 years, probably not a good place for an addict, and in that bar. It's funny, at the end of the night, we would all go, we'd go over to someone's house and I would be sitting there telling them about Revelation in the Bible. I read about it when I was in jail my numerous times and I would tell them about, tell them about God and, and they would quit and find the Lord that night and I'd go, what am, I, what am I saying? I'm losing friends. 
And what was, what was happening, I think it was always me trying to convince myself. And God was chasing me all those years. I had all these near-death experiences and all these things happening. But one of the things that bothered me uh, or that followed me, if I had that bar and a stranger came in the bar and I wasn't, uh, I, if there was no one else in there, I would wait on him and say, you know, let me know if you need anything. And I'd be over in the corner acting like I'm busy going, please leave, please leave. Because I couldn't talk. I, I, I couldn't talk to people. And uh, the reason for that, I look back now and I think it was fear of rejection where you can't get rejected if you don't talk. And they, um, and then about in the early 2000s, and I've been married 20 years, functioning addict, had raised four kids. And, and uh, about that time, I, um, I had a dream. I had sold my bars. I didn't want to. And there's a, I think in life, people look back and things that are devastating at the time, you look back and you say, wow, that had to happen or I wouldn't be where I'm at. And uh, so it was about 2004, I had the, God gave me this dream for this pillow. And my sister, or my, I mean, my, one of my daughters came upstairs, she goes, I would wrote my pillow all over the house back when my pillow wasn't common or those that names, any mys weren't common. She goes, what are you doing, dad? And I said, I'm gonna invent this pillow. It's gonna be called my pillow. It's gonna change the world. And she goes, that's really random. And went back downstairs. Well. I, I, um, I invented, it took about a year and a half to invent, but I was turned down everywhere. Every, every box store, every place we went, I was turned down. And they, um, and, and uh, someone said, well, Mike, why don't you do a kiosk? I said, well, how do you spell that? And I ended up doing this kiosk and I sold, oh, I, I couldn't go there. I couldn't be there because I couldn't talk to people. So I was only there one of the days and this guy came up and bought a pillow and he said, you got a business card? I go, no, no, I'm all out. And I wrote it on a piece of paper and gave it to him. And, and the, the kiosk failed. And then that January, that one day that I was there, it was like a divine appointment. He called me up. He said, are you the guy that invented this pillow from Minnesota? I said, yes. He said, well, this changed my life. He says, I run the Minneapolis Home and Garden Show. Would you like a spot in there? So I went there. And I did this and I changed the booth. I put a table in between me and the people so that I could, and I, they would have an agenda to come up and I could talk. Well, I mean, and the first day of that show, I sold about 10 pillows. Well, the next day, all 10 of them came back and they, and they came up to me and they're just, they paid to get back in the show and said, you know, this, uh, this pillow changed my life or this, you know, this helped me so much. And I, I felt so good inside. It wasn't about the pillow or the money. It was about helping people. And it just made me feel like I had some self-worth and I felt that I had, you know, self-worth, I guess, was all I can say there. And they, so I did shows and fairs for um, years, but the, for like seven years. But during that time, I ended up getting divorced of 20 years. This is where crack cocaine just took over. And there was a lot of betrayal. Um, and from people that were taking my company, all kinds of stuff. Well, in 2008, it, now this was a big year for me that changed everything. Um, I look back and I go, wow, these things that had to happen in 2008. Well, uh, it, it, was, um, it was February of 2008 and I had been on this little public access TV channel, this Christian channel, and this lady would run it every now and then uh, that I had been on and I in fact even going on there I went there one day to I was going down to Minneapolis to buy drugs and and I remember she said to stop in sometime So I stopped in she said Mike will you go on TV right now? And I go no, I'm not going on TV I was petrified to go on TV and she talked me into it and anyone that's seen that said that knew me Said you didn't have any drugs did you and anyone that anyone that didn't know me said uh, what were you on drugs because I was so nervous and I couldn't you know couldn't talk well That night that, that night in February 2008 I get a call and every once in a while she'd rerun that show and she said uh, This lady called up. She says yeah, she said I um, I seen you on channel 6 She said I I don't want to buy a pillow I want God said what you're doing is so important You should never give up and then I want to pray with you and I said sure so she's praying, I'm putting her on mute and doing cocaine on the side and going back and forth. And, and this went on for a half hour. About an hour later, I get another call, it's a different lady. She says, are you this guy on channel six that I've seen? And I said, yes. Yeah. She says, yeah, she said, God call, I feel like God's telling me I should call and pray with you. And I said, okay. 
So we prayed for an hour and a half, and I, you know, I'm mutant, doing my drugs. Well, about three in the morning, this guy calls up and he said, are you this guy on Channel 6? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, let me tell you something, buddy. I don't believe in God. And he goes, but I keep getting this dream that I'm supposed to tell you what, what you're doing is important to God. I hope my dreams stop now, you jerk, and <laughs> slams the phone down. And then... The, the next guy, the next lady calls up at seven in the morning and she goes, I said, you don't want to buy a pillow, you want to pray. She said, yeah. And I said, she goes, how did you know? And I said, it seems to be the thing tonight. Well, anyway, the, um, what happened then, from that day, there was things going on where I, I ended up going downtown. I had a warrant out for my arrest for, from the night of those calls. And I went downtown Minneapolis to hide out down there. And it was, I was up for 14 days and I came out of the room, and they, my three of the biggest drug dealers, Minneapolis, all my friends, they go, uh, they knew of each other but had never met. And I go, what are you guys doing? They go, you've been up for 14 days, you're going to bed. And you're, you, we're cutting you off. I go, what is this, an intervention? They said, well, call it whatever you want. Well, two of them left, and the one that I went down to the street, I guess, and uh, got the word out. The other one finally fell asleep right at about the time I was carpet farming for crack. And... I, and he finally went to sleep. I headed down to the streets of Minneapolis, and about an hour later, I came up. I couldn't buy crack from anyone. They're going, no way, man, no way. I get back upstairs, and he says to me, he goes, you know, Mike, he said, you've been telling us for years this, pi this pillow thing is just a platform for God, and you're going to come back someday and help us all out of this addiction world we're living in. And... And, they, and he goes, give me your phone. I'm going to take a picture. You're going to need it for that book you've been telling us you're going to write someday. And this is the picture he took that night. That, that's a picture he took that night. And he, uh, it is on the cover of my book, by the way. And uh, two of those guys are born-again Christians. They work for me. But, uh, but, I, uh, but anyway, what I did then... After I didn't quit that day, or after you know, I went to I slept, of course. But then the, later on that year, it was December of that year. It was December, and in December, I got the, the um, my friend came to me, and it was I was losing everything. I had completely. I was you know, it was out this little farm place. I already lost my other house, and he was my equal in every way. He was a. Um, we had both started cocaine at the same time. We had both switched to crack at the same time, functioning addicts. But I had heard somewhere that he had been straight for four years and he had fell in the Lord. And here he comes out of nowhere. And I go, Dick, what are you doing? He goes, he goes, what are you doing? And I go, I go, well, as long as you're here, I said, I got some questions for you. I said, Dick, is it boring? He said, no, man, it ain't boring. And I, I drilled him for about an hour of questions. And then only he could answer. I had been in and out of treatment centers back in the 80s. You get a DWI, you go there to save jail time. And they didn't work, these secular treatment centers. But Dick, I trusted. The counselors there, you, you, I've forgotten more about addiction than they even knew because they went to, you know, if they, I want someone that's been there. And Dick had been where I'd been, so I trusted, you know, I call him my hope match, okay? Well, now I didn't quit that day, but on, on January 16, 2009, I actually, I, I knew that my, they say, was that your bottom, Mike? I say, well, I knew that, I made sure I didn't have any money, that it'd be the greatest comeback ever with God, all things are possible. But one of the things I, I knew was gonna be gone was my calling. God was gonna, we all have callings, and my calling was gonna be gone if I waited one more day. And so I gave God a prayer. I said, God, okay, I'm gonna do this, this big platform thing that you have, and, and, but I want to wake up in the morning and never have the desire again for any addiction and any drugs. And that's what I said. And they, uh, the next morning I woke up, it was like Groundhog Day. Something's different. And it was gone. The desire was gone. Okay. But they, uh, I mean, that was a miraculous miracle. I've never, I've never had a desire since that day. But one of the things, then I was with my sister, and she said, well, you gotta, you gotta, we got to pray for favor. And, and I said, well, what's this favor? And uh, she said, it's in the Bible and stuff, and she tells me about it. And, and uh, well, one of the things, my company had been taken, and, and I had to go get $30,000 
uh, from people I didn't even know, and they all wore ties, which scared me back then. If you wore a tie, well, I'm not worthy. And um, and so I walk into this room to get these to get this uh, um, to get borrow this 30 grand from people I don't even know, and much less I couldn't talk if, because I didn't have my drugs. But I walked in there with a T-shirt on and three jars of foam, and there's a CEO, a CIEIO, and all these C's lined up. And I said, so I started telling them these guys had taken my company. I used to be a crack addict, and I, um, I, need, I need to borrow money. I'll pay you back in two months. The one guy goes, when do you quit crack? And I said, last Thursday. <laughs> and, but they ended up giving me the money. The point of that story is that was a miracle. They gave me that money there. And... Um, but things kept happening. I went to, two months later, I felt led to go to a faith-based treatment center at our church to maybe to find out why I was an addict in the first place. And I got in there and it was different than any other center that I'd ever been in, any secular center. They were focusing on Jesus and they asked about my father. I go, what do you mean my father? I come from a divorced family. I said, I, said, I had a fine upbringing. And that they found all these wounds the back that, I, that uh, they planted so many seeds that I, or opened up that uh, seeds of hope, I guess I would call them, when I left there. Well, when I left there, I, you know, it didn't fully take, I guess. And anyway, I go on in TV then, and we, are, we had completely um, um, got to spend two years getting my pillow back. And I said, let's do an infomercial where it's going to be the biggest infomercial in history. And my friend, I didn't know infomercials fail. And my friends and family, we all pooled our money together. And we went to film the night before. I remember, I couldn't talk to people. And they said, the one guy says, the one producer texts the other guy when we were doing our reads. He said, this is the worst guy I've ever seen in history. He'll never make it on TV. And he says, he's paying you. Just go with it. Well, we did this commercial. And it launched October 7, 2011 at 3 in the morning and it exploded. I had 10 employees and 40 days later, I had 500 employees. And, but the story, the, the story is that then you always seen me on TV wearing my cross, right? Well, in two, by 2014, you know, I always wore my cross on TV and, and not, you know, crack house, it didn't matter. I always wore my cross and people would call up and say, you know, I was the only call center. Are you wearing that cross to sell pillows, blah, blah, blah. And, and I, there's some atheists and I'd go, I'd sit there and tell them about the Lord, and they'd hang up the phone saved, and I go, there, take that. And I wasn't even saved yet. <laughs> and anyway, we did this. By the time we got so big, and by the, but by the time 2014 came along, we were within two days of going under, and I met a gal, she's here tonight with me, Kendra, and she said, you know, she started telling me I, get, I got, fell away from God. And... I started, you know, praying, and she's having me praying, and I said, what do you have that I don't have? Well, she had a personal relationship with Jesus. That's, I believed in God. I just didn't have that personal relationship. And so I wanted that, and I'm going, and, you know, we, in our lives, we all have things that happen. You have a one in a million or a one in a billion, or this is impossible, and you add them together, and when does it become a miracle? And that's the way I was. For me, I would say, God, show me things that it's absolutely impossible. And, and I would go, that has to be God. Well, things started happening. Um, in, the, in 2015, I had a dream that I'd be in a room with Donald Trump. And, and then he ends up, he says he's running for president. Well, then the following um, uh, January, I, get, I go to the national prayer breakfast. And remember, I'm not saved yet. I go there and I'm randomly picked out of the 12 people to pray in a room with Dr. Ben Carson and who's running for president at the time. And things like that kept happening that whole year. But I, and I'm, t I'm telling everyone, you know, I seen, a, I seen me and Donald Trump in a room together. And now the summer of 16, he was, um, I was flying to California and I'm in the bulkhead of the plane and I go, and I had this magazine I had bought on, on Donald Trump, and it was, like a, it was like a big catalog, and I opened it up, and, and I got up, it was at 10,000 feet where you finally have a cell phone signal, and I'm sitting there, and I go, okay, this is like late, late July, early August of 2016, and I go, I go, God, I know I've seen uh, a dream with me and Donald Trump in this room. What do I have to do with it? I want an answer. I need an answer right now. At that moment in time, my phone dinged. Mike, this is Donald Trump. Will you meet me at Trump Tower in New York City? And I'm going, Jesus? You know, and, 
And I start, and the flight attendant's going, are you okay? I go, yes, it's a miracle! You know, <laughs> but for me, it was a miracle. My prayer was answered right in that real time. It was impossible. So, this, so the meeting is set up for August 15, 2016. So here's this ex-crack addict going in to meet a potential president, and they go, whatever you do, don't tell them you're on crack, or you were on crack, and whatever you do, it's never gonna be a meeting alone. Well, that meeting, the way God lined it up, it was alone, and I walked in there, and he goes, Mike, he said, it was just him and I, he goes, you always wear your cross on TV, are you a Christian? I said, yes, Mr. Trump, and this, this is a divine appointment. And we talked for about a half hour on different things, bringing jobs back. And one of the things I said, you know, I used to be a crack addict. And I went like that. And, and he, he says, uh, I said, I want to have this addiction network that's going to be the biggest in history to help addicts. Um, and he goes, and you know what? I'm going to stop the drugs from pouring in. And we were talking back and forth. And I left his, I left his office and I said, wow, he's going to be the greatest president in history. And... He hasn't let me down either. He is the greatest. And, uh, but I walked out of there and I couldn't believe what I seen. So I even questioned his employees and they go, he's the greatest the boss, greatest this. And so I validated everything that I had just seen. And, and so I went all in. I mean, I went absolutely all in. But my story doesn't where it's, where it, where it gets, where I'm getting to. So here, all the promises he made that day, including addiction. You know, we have, we have states, we have 30 some states where they have laws on the book where you, in order to treat an addict, you have to go to college for four years and swim the English Channel, climb 20 trees, all this bureaucracy. Well, I want the person that's been there to treat me. And anyway, I get up, it gets up to, uh, these things kept happening. I kept getting put in place. I'm going, this is, can only be God that I'm put in all these positions. And it got up to February 18, 2017, and I went to a, a retreat. It's actually for veterans, and I was invited there by a divine appointment co called Operation Restored Warrior. And I get in there, and I went in there with hope, and Kendra's, Kendra was with a lot of hope. She's going, she's going, you're gonna get saved, you're gonna, you know, and I'm going, okay, I'm, you know, I'm, I went in there with open, an open heart. And uh, I came out of there with a restored heart. I did a full surrender on February 18, 2017 to Jesus. And it was the most peaceful thing. It was like this burden that came off of me where I could go out, not even two months later, here's a guy that couldn't speak. And I am speaking to, I led the 50,000 millennials in prayer at US Bank Stadium. And it was, it, I did that and I was, you know, it, it was a lot easier. I thought I just gave it to the Lord. Well, two weeks later, I was in an amusement park with my granddaughter. And all these millennials were coming up to me, these kids, and they're going, your story of all these Christian bands and all this stuff there, your story meant so much to me. I found Jesus and I'm going, it was God confirming to me that I was on the right path for my calling to help people to Jesus, just like I did helping them with a pillow back then. And it made me feel so good that my story meant something. And here, Shortly after that, then, I start getting invited to the White House for the, and here we have a picture of me at the opiate. The president was good on his word, and this was the signing of the opiate bill. And I'm there, and my friends are all going, what's this ex-crack addict on TV with the president? Jesus is real. There's no way that happens. And, 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 I, and I want to tell you all the, where, where we're at now, last fall, I was with the guy and he said, you know, he said, Mike, people don't reach out to Jesus and to God unless something bad's going on. And he said, like the Great Depression. And I said, no, they said the Great Depression, they had, they had Jesus and God, but they were, they were praying for physical things like food and shelter. I said, we have something better than that. We have addiction, which affects everyone, and they're praying for souls. And I said, so I believe addiction is the opportunity of a lifetime for the biggest revival in history. And, and that, that network I told the president about, it has come to fruition. 
It's called the Lindale Recovery Network, and I partnered with the return here. When, the, when they met me last spring and said, you know, Mike, we're going to have this day of, rep of prayer and repentance, and you need repentance before you have revival. And that's what we're going to have. And if uh, you can all get on, you can all help out today by going to Star Star Pray and get involved. And it's going to be, it's going to keep on going. We're going to bring millions of people. It's not getting people out of addiction. That's just a bonus. The big thing is getting people to Jesus. So God bless you all. And thank you all for being here. And, and uh, I hope my story helps someone out there. And uh, we all know, we all know that terrible things are happening with addiction, but we all also know someone that's made it through and make that person your hope match. Thank you.
us your glory. Show us your glory. In wonder and surrender, we fall down, Lord. And God, show us your glory. God, show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground right now, Lord. Move right now, Lord. Move right now, oh God. All over the world, Lord. All over the world, Lord. Yeah. Let me sing this one more time. May the chains, may they fall. And may that fear, may it bow right here and now. Because Jesus, you change everything. And lives be healed. And hope, may it be found here and now. Say, Jesus, Jesus, you change everything. Jesus, you change. Jesus, you change everything. Jesus, you change everything. Jesus, you change everything. One more time. Jesus, you change everything. Change us, Lord. Good evening. Hi, I'm Mark Cook, and I already feel guilty. I'm sitting here beside stage seeing you guys get rained on, and I wish I was out there with you. But let me tell you, you gotta have special favor, because as I stare at that monument, which says at the top, praise be to God, you're sitting in holy ground, and I claim victory on this mall and holy ground. A quick background, a little bit like Mike Lindell. We've, I don't have to give my testimony so much because we're, we may be twin brothers separated at birth. Uh, again, Mark Cook, my background's film. I produced a movie called Lost in Space back in 1998. And now I know why, because I was lost in space. I wasn't a Christian and a song comes to mind right now. And it's a song that says, still remember where you found me. So amazed at where I stand. And as I sit here in this place, I'm amazed that lost in space, saved by grace. God pulled me out of the muck of Hollywood into the light of his precious son, Jesus Christ. And I am honored to be here. Um, getting right to it. You know, we all have a, a DNA in the flesh. I believe we all have a DNA, a divine natural assignment. And I know mine. Sometimes I ask, Lord, why me? My DNA is very simple. It's to expose the enemy and take back this nation from the lies, the divide and conquer, and the garbage that he is doing to our children and this nation. I want to share with you tonight, and I think it's a perfect time to do this. That's why I'm here and I know it. So Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, speak through me, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Bless these people. We claim this holy ground. DNA, divine natural assignment. Here's mine, to expose the enemy. Give you guys three key elements, three keys to unlock effective, powerful prayer. God woke me up a couple months ago and said, war, war, we're in a war. I'm like, I know, Lord, no, war. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities of darkness and heavenly places. And I'm here to tell you that the enemy may have authority over the airways, but we have authority over him. These three keys, please do these. Tomorrow when you get up, war, war, W, wash yourself and cleanse yourself with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Repent. A, armor up, armor up or get slaughtered. It says put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand up to everything the enemy throws your way. Which means if you don't, you can't. And finally, R for war. Refill yourself with the Holy Spirit. This is holy ground. God bless you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Gloria Garces. And as we come together tonight in this important act of repentance, I ask that you join me on a journey to heal a wound created by our Christian past and one that is constantly reopened and reinfected by our present, even by our own accounts. 
please close your eyes for a second and think of the last time you slapped someone or you punched them or you stabbed them or you threw rocks at them. For many of us, this is not a memory that we have because we have never physically done this. But what about with our words that can cut deeper than a knife? Our thoughts and beliefs, our actions or inaction, our emotions. When we consider our relationship with Jews, with Judaism, or our stand towards Israel, can we truly examine ourselves and say that we are healers of this wound? Let's think of the Crusades, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, or even the unsavory words, the laws that we have allowed to be passed, the jokes, the silence. Our history is plagued with Christians acting in hate. Instead of representing Jesus, our savior of Jewish lineage and love. I am actually a victim of this kind of hate. My family is so too, because of the work that we do for our Jewish friends. But tonight we can make a decision to be together and change this, to start healing. We all have the power to love and not hate, to heal and not hurt, to resolve to make friendship with our Jewish neighbors, to educate ourselves and educate others about anti-Jewish hate and to confront that hatred whenever we see it, just as our Christian faith calls us to. So we've created a campaign. It's called WeResolveMovement.org. You can visit it and you can reaffirm your commitment to stand against hate. Because as we ask God to heal our land, as we ask for global revival, we need to understand that we need to have global repentance and restitution in this area as well. So I call on to you that you touch your hearts, that you stop the hatred, and that today you say, yes, I will, will resolve to do this. And you can visit us again, weresolvemovement.org or in Spanish, noscomprometemos.org. I'll see you there. And let's start as we are getting washed down today, washing that history and changing our reality. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Bradshaw, and I just am honored to be here tonight. I know as it's pouring rain on us, we're here to declare before the Lord and before the nation that the Jesus movement is not canceled. I believe that the Lord is going to put the person of Jesus on display in America in the midst of this time, perhaps like never before in our nation's history. I love the verse in Isaiah chapter 4. It says, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful in that day. And the branch of the Lord is Jesus. I believe there's a generation that many of them are in despair. But the Holy Spirit is about to make Jesus beautiful to them from coast to coast, from north to south, and we're gathered here today in a place of hope as we return to the Lord in the beginning stages of a great awakening. And I want to share just briefly a testimony with you all. Just a few years ago, we felt the Lord said to come to this very place, the National Mall, and to set up 50 tents on the National Mall and to call thousands of musicians and singers to gather 24-7 in all 50 tents and to host the presence of the Lord right in the center of our nation's capital. And we had no idea how to do this, but we felt the Lord was leading us into something that was unprecedented and had never been done. I share this testimony not to point to a moment, but to say God's ways are not our ways, are they? Who would have thought of gathering thousands of musicians on the National Mall, that they would sing the name of Jesus day and night, and that the presence of Jesus himself would come into the city and come into the nation and change everything? Well, we didn't know what was going to happen, but 1,600 worship teams showed up on the National Mall. They filled 58 tents 24-7 and the presence of Jesus filled this city. I want to say, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how many challenges we face, the Jesus movement is not canceled. 
There is no backwards movement for the kingdom of God. I believe the kingdom of God is moving forward right now in the midst of this crisis in America. And I believe there's great hope for Generation Z. I believe there's great hope for millennials. I believe there's great hope for our nation. So as we gathered and 1,600 worship teams sang and we put our faces on the ground, do you know what began to happen? People all over the National Mall began to give their life to Jesus. One young girl standing right out here was standing with scars all over her body from where she had cut herself. And as she worshiped the Lord, she realized every single scar had been removed from her body as she worshiped the Lord. I want to tell you, there's something greater than the scars of division and bitterness and lawlessness and racism and every other injustice and sin issue that our nation is facing. The blood of Jesus is stronger. And I believe right now in the cities of America, God is inviting young people and older people to begin to gather on our campuses as begin to move in worship and prayer. We just bought a 3,000 person tent. We're dreaming of going to cities and campuses to gather and bring the ark of the presence of God. I share this with you because I believe it's gonna go viral. It's going to go everywhere. And the Lord is inviting a generation to find their voice before him. And I wanna to declare to you, there is great hope for this nation as we stand in the pouring rain, just as the rain is coming down. The Lord is about to pour out His Spirit on America. In Jesus' name, amen. God, in our nation at one point in time, we, your people, we knew the Word. We cry out, revive us, O Lord, according to Thy Word. We use the word imminent like we believe, but our lives continue to push the button of snooze. Please forgive us. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus is the coming Lord. Wake up! He'll descend with a shout from heaven to gather those who embrace good news. We have confidence in him. Sadly, we don't see the message rapidly spread. Please forgive us. In 2 Thessalonians, Jesus is the faithful Lord who will strengthen us from the evil one and give us the power to trample and tread. We try and we try and we try to get to the other side, yet we know there's only one bridge. Please forgive us. In 1 Timothy, Jesus is the mediator. Between God and humanity, he serves as a ransom for all to cross to the eternal ridge. It's time for sound doctrine and stop bitching ears who desire to hear something new. We, your people, repent. In 2 Timothy, Jesus is the righteous judge who's going to judge the living and the dead with no exceptions through and through. As we wait for the blessed hope, why have we become more about the works that we've done? Please forgive us in Titus, Jesus is the savior. Having been justified by his grace, we have been washed and renewed by the love of God's son. When others do us wrong or we are to express mercy, we're always keeping tally and count. We repent. In Philemon, Jesus is the master, our only master, the Messiah who brings about forgiveness, charges it to his own account. In our nation at one point in time, we are people, we knew the word, we cry out, revive us, O Lord, according to thy word. Even though the curtain of flesh was opened through his blood, we can't stay entrenched in sin, we repent. In Hebrews, Jesus is the high priest, giving us a new way to live, to draw near with a true heart and sprinkle clean from within. Over and over, we hear, don't talk the talk, rather walk the walk, lest us not become forgetful. Please forgive us. In James, Jesus is the perfect law who provides freedom and focus to become doers of the word, to be fruitful. Because of his mercy, we are given a new birth. Yet over time, we've become fearful and afraid. Please forgive us. In 1 Peter, Jesus is the living hope. Through the resurrection of the dead, we have an inheritance that won't perish, rust, or fade. Because his call is to the straight and narrow. Many attempt to mislead us in their false ways. Please forgive us. Beware. In 2 Peter, Jesus is the master of truth, where no man has ever spoken like him with authority and power in all of our days. There is no fear in love, yet with the fear of punishment and death, at times it remains unclear. Please forgive us. In 1 John, Jesus is the perfect love, where God in human flesh gave his life on the cross to drive out fear. So we cry out, revive us, O Lord, according to thy word. Even with the word of God as a bedrock for our nation, some say there's no truth whatsoever. Please forgive us. In 2 John, Jesus is the truth 
who came to testify. The truth that remains in us will be with us forever. We know we are to reflect his sinless ways, yet we feel the tension of imitating what is evil. We, your people, bend. In 3 John, Jesus is the perfect example. So when we have the mind of Christ and we walk as he did, we will see a true spiritual upheaval. We must keep ourselves in the love of God and not cave to the ways of promiscuity and denial. Please forgive us. In Jude, Jesus is the merciful Lord who in these times calls us to stand firm and snatch others from the fiery trial. In our nation at one point in time, we, your people, we knew your word. And we cry out, revive us, O Lord, according to thy word. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Now is the time not to slack. Please forgive us. In Revelation, Jesus is the I am. The one who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty will be back. In our nation, at one point in time, we, your people, we knew the word. We cry out, revive us, O Lord, according to thy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What an honor it is to be here at the Return Next Generations. My name is Juan Penzon, and if you can't tell by looking at me, well, I'm a millennial. And you see, when Kevin Jessup, my mentor, asked me to give a prophetic word to my generation, I knew exactly what that word would be, because you see, the Lord had been speaking this into my heart for the last year, and had put this in the heart of prophetic men and women for the last 20 to 30 years. You see, friends, I believe that God is a God of generations. And in Exodus 3, 6, when God and Moses met at the site of the burning bush, the voice called out from within, from within and said, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. And what God was doing in that moment was intentionally letting Moses know that he was a generational God. Friends, we all know the calling that Moses took upon his life, but right as they were about to enter the promised land, the Lord took Moses up to the mountain, said, look out to the land, and there's the Jordan, and you will not cross it. Friends, the Lord gave that transitional responsibility over to a man named Joshua. And Joshua was Moses' assistant. You see, friends, tonight I believe that we are the Joshua generation. We are the transitional generation to bring the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ into a new space, into a new land. You see, God is with us. I'm talking to the Gen Zs and the millennials out there, for I am one. And we have been giving dominion over a new space and a new land. You want to know what that place is? It's wherever there's Wi-Fi. You see, friends, online we're able to reach the corners of the earth that have never been reached for the gospel. We're able to touch people in seconds because God has ordained it. Never underestimate the power of God to reach people. And three things that Joshua brought with him, I believe we are to bring today. We are to bring the Word of God. You see, Joshua brought with him the tablets of Moses that he left behind into this new space. I think it's funny tonight, we, uh, today, we also have tablets. The second thing that he brought with him was the Ark of the Covenant, the living presence of Jesus Christ. We know now today that we are to bring Jesus into a new space, just as Joshua brought the Ark of the Covenant. And the third thing that he brought was the culture of the supernatural. You see, friends, for 40 years, Joshua grew up in the background watching Moses intervene with God and, and pleading with him. And he watched God open the Red Sea, birth a new nation. He saw him provide food from the sky, water from a rock, guided them day and night through a cloud of smoke and a pillar of fire. These people knew how to live just by the provision of God. And I want to leave my generation with the very calling that Joshua gave them in Joshua 3, 5. Sanctify yourselves, separate yourselves, and watch what wonders I will do through you. And tonight, if you feel anxious, if you feel depressed, if you feel like 2020 has been one of the craziest years of your life, I want to let you know that I share in that sentiment, but my God is greater. And in Joshua 1.9, the Lord told Joshua the very first thing I'm going to leave you with here tonight. In Joshua 1.9, he says, do not be afraid, be courageous, for I am with you 
always. And tonight this generation stands and at the gap for the unrighteous and stands at the gap for the generation that isn't here. Tonight we are to bring Jesus into this new space. My God, in the name of Jesus, I proclaim that we are to bring you into this new space. Would you give us the anointing to bring you into this new space and to reach the places that have never been felt by the love, by the love that you have for us. My God, would you do this great will? Thank you. Shalom, shalom from Jerusalem. My name is Lily Cerrone. I am 23 years old and I live right here in the Holy City. The Lord brought me to Israel when I was 18 years old and He's done a work in me in this country ever since. And so today I want to pray with you about Israel, but also for my generation, for our generation. So if you'd bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this country. I thank you for the amazing work that you have done with the Jewish people, Lord, bringing them back to their land after thousands of years. Father, I ask that you would pour out your abundant blessing on this nation and on these people, God. Lord, that you would go before them into the rest of 2020 and beyond. Father, I plead the blood over this people, over every single boundary and border. Lord, your protection over the nation of Israel, because you are their God and you neither slumber nor sleep. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to Israel because it means that you are faithful to us. Father, I just want to move and pray for our generation, for my generation. And first, I want to repent. God, on behalf of my generation, I repent for when we have been arrogant, for when we've been prideful, for when we've thought that we know better than those who've gone before us. God, forgive us. Forgive us for when we've thought that we knew better than you. Father, I just ask that you would give us a passion that matches your heart, Father. That you would go before us as we march into the future, into your future. That it would be exactly what you have called us to be doing. Lord, I ask that you would unite us, that you would make us one in Christ, and I thank you for the work that you're doing, Father, for all of the doors that you're opening to this generation. We bless you, and we honor you, Father, for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening. My name is Paul Lavelle. I'm a retired Chief Master Sergeant in the United States Air Force. I served on active duty for 26 years, and in 2008, I founded a ministry called Operation Restored Warrior that focuses on the restoration of our nation's veterans in active duty who are suffering from the epidemic of suicide. The focus of our entire nation over the past six months has been on COVID-19 pandemic. However, there is a more sinister pandemic that's been preying on our veterans and their families and it's the spirit of death in the form of suicide. According to the VA, an alarming rate of 20 to 22 veterans a day are taking their lives. I recently read a startling statistic from the Military Times that said 79,000 veterans have died by suicide from 2005 to 2017. That's more than the total number of troops that died in combat in the last 30 years, which is 65,000. To put that in perspective, look at the Vietnam Memorial right close by here. There are 58,000 who lost their lives during the war. In contrast, you would have to add 20 more panels to the Vietnam Memorial to honor the nearly 79,000 veterans who have killed themselves. That's unacceptable as a nation, and every American citizen should know that. History reminds us that countries that fail to take care of their military veterans will cease to exist. The core issue with suicide, it's hopelessness, which is a spiritual issue. The curse released against our veterans is the spirit of death. In 2 Corinthians 4.18, it says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. In prayer, I heard that the spirit of death, or premature death, has been released over our nation through the door of abortion. I heard that this curse has unleashed the spirit of death 
in suicide over our veterans, active duty, and many others in our nation. Matthew 18, 18 says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever is bound or is loosed in heaven is loosed on earth. So brothers and sisters all over this country and all around the world, we must bring Jesus into this spiritual battle that is stamping out the lives of our nation's veterans and active duty. And it is our battle in the spiritual realm to restore hope by repenting, praying, and standing in the authority and in the name of Jesus. In Luke 4.18, Jesus reads from Isaiah 61.1 and he says, I have come to heal the brokenhearted and set the captive free and release from darkness the prisoners. That was his mission and that is our commission. Today, we are unleashing a hundred million angels under the authority of Jesus to fight for our veterans, our active duty, and our nation. Please bow your heads and open your hearts. Our Father, we come to you on behalf of our veterans and active duty of our armed forces. Thank you for the proud heritage of the many branches of our military. Thank you for the men and women who serve and have served this country so bravely. We cry out to you, God, to end this epidemic of suicide on our military. We cry out to you, Jesus, for the rescue of every woman and every man who's compelled to take their life. As the nation's prime protectors, we are most vulnerable to the spirit of death that thrives in the sins of our entire nation. So Jesus, we ask for your forgiveness for the innocent blood that's been shed, not just by armed forces in war, but by the acts of abortion that have proliferated throughout our nation's history. We pray for redemption, for pardon. We pray for your power of your love and your life that reigns against this place of premature death. And we repent and renounce the hold that we have given death. Jesus, you are Lord of life. You're the giver of life. And we pray for an outpouring of your love and your hope over our armed forces and our veterans. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Jerry Boykin. I spent 36 and a half years serving this nation. I am grieved by what I see happening in America today. After seeing men pay the ultimate price for this nation, it, uh, it hurts me deeply to see what's happening to our nation. But you know, some things are deceptive because a lot of what we see happening today is because there are no fathers in the home, because there are no men to give guidance inside the homes. You know, I was on uh, Fox News here a few weeks ago and they were watching all these riots and Neil Cavuto said to me, what's, what do you think about this? And my only answer was, where are the men? Where are the men? Look at the absentee fathers. Look at the statistics of what's happening. In 1958, the Communist Party USA wrote a book called The Naked Communist. They told us exactly how they would take over America. And among the things they said they were going to do was they were going to go after families. They were going to destroy the family because the family is the most important structure in American society. But in destroying the families, they would destroy the men. Look at what you see happening in this nation today, where we've added the term toxic to the word masculinity, where men are confused now, where men don't know what they're supposed to be, where men are being beaten down and told they're no different than a woman. Men, you're much different. You've got a different role. You've got a different role. You need to rise up. You need to find your courage. The Bible says in Exodus 15:3. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. And now it's time for you to rise up and be the warrior that God's called you to be. I'm not talking about falling out in the streets with you AR-15s. I'm talking about rising up, finding your courage, and being the man that God has called you to be. Because our homes are suffering. Our society is falling apart because you men don't know what a man is supposed to be. You're not being a man. You're not acting like a man. And now is the time for us to recognize that if we want substantive change, 
in the direction of this country, we need leadership. And you men are raised. You come out of the womb, born to be a warrior, but your mission is to be leaders. So men, find your courage, rise up, and be the man that God has called you to be. My organization is running a new set of conferences called Stand Courageous. And that's exactly what you ought to be doing right now. Standing Courageous. Standing Courageous is men of God in the home, in the community, in the church, leading and being the warriors that God's called you to be. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we come before you asking that you would raise our men up, God, to be what you call them to be, Lord. Let them be the protectors of our freedoms, God. Let them be the, the chaplains in our home, God. Let them be the, the men who instruct and teach our children and our communities. God, let them be the defenders. Let them be the protectors. Let them be the providers. God, let them provide direction through their leadership. God, give them courage. God, let them not tremble in fear, but let them stand boldly. And just as Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Let them stand and say, here am I, send me, God. I'll go into battle. I'll put on the whole armor of God to defend my family, to defend my nation, to defend those values that I hold dear. Lord, we thank you, God, that you've given us men. But now we ask you, Lord, to multiply them, to give us a multiplication blessing among those men who are willing to stand and be counted, those men who are willing to stand up against the evil, stand toe-to-toe -to -toe against the enemy, and say, here am I, Lord, send me. Amen. And now, ladies and gentlemen, would you join me as we watch a video by a great warrior who paid a tremendous price, Dave Reaver. Today, O oh God, we stand in unison with Christ followers worldwide and across this great nation in search of your profound guidance during profound difficulties. Difficulties self-imposed by rebellious nations separated from you and turned against you. We walked away from you. Our blood-bought freedom is more threatened than ever before in living history. Our honored military laying down their lives for liberty never intended their sacrifice to be so flagrantly wasted on self-interest and hatred in America today. We walked away from you. Never in our lifetime has the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, been so maligned, distorted, berated in the name of higher learning that has brought us to our lowest level in spiritual betrayal. We walked away from you. Scriptures and commandments on our political statues and memorials have chiseled into marble walls the words that were once written in the tablets of our hearts and are now being canceled in hearts of stone. We walked away from you. Heavenly Father, please forgive us our sins as we seek your face and walk back that road to recovery and return to you and a spiritual awakening. Return to us today, O oh God, we pray. In el nombre del Padre y Jesucristo y del Espíritu Santo. Amen. Amen. Thank you to Dave Reaver and General Boykin. Let us continue in prayer on behalf of our veterans. We give thanks for their service, their character, their sacrifice. Thank you, Father, that America is the land of the free and the home of the brave because of our great veterans and their families. I pray for hope, help, and healing for our veterans. Father God, stay the hand of the 22 who will lose hope today and possibly take their lives. Father God, provide healing, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, and relational healing for our veterans. Mobilize our nation on behalf of veterans. Quicken our spirits across this land to help and to empower and to unleash their full God-given potential. May our veterans serve as role models, patriots, educators of the next generation, and leaders in all aspects of American life. Most of all, Father, may their souls abide in prosperity. May they be transformed in the power of your Son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit to be kingdom warriors on your behalf. Daniel prayed, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, take action. We pray this today on behalf of our veterans. In the powerful name of the ultimate resilient warrior, Jesus Christ, amen.
And Father, I want to pray Psalm 37 over our military. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they wither quickly like grass and wilt like tender green plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent. Let go of your grip before the Lord and wait expectantly for him. Do not be agitated by one who prospers in his way, by the man who carries out evil plans. Refrain from anger and give up your rage. Do not be agitated. It can only bring harm. For evildoers will be destroyed, but those who put their hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Good evening. My name is Chaplain Gordon Klingenschmidt. Some know me as Dr. Chaps. And in 2006, I was a Navy chaplain, and I had to take a stand because the government wrote a bad policy, said, you're not allowed to pray in Jesus' name outside of church. Well, how many of you know that I took a stand? I stood in front of the White House, and I prayed in Jesus' name anyway. I demanded my own misdemeanor court-martial, and God bless the Navy brass, they granted my request. I was punished for my act of defiance, and yet, because 300,000 Americans like you petitioned Congress, we were vindicated. Congress changed the law, the Navy reversed the policy, and now the chaplains can pray in Jesus' name. I want to invite everyone to pray for religious freedom in our military. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray for our chaplains today. We pray for our troops today. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. Let everyone who serves be able to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. That the same sacrifice they give for others, sometimes even their lives on foreign battlefields, so that we have religious freedom. God, now give religious freedom to our troops. God bless the administration. God bless the admirals and generals at the Pentagon, that they will defend the rights of our military to lift up and proclaim the name of Jesus. Yes. Father, we ask your blessing on America, on our military, and God help us in some way to establish your kingdom around the world. We pray in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Tonight we have a special guest and one of, a, one of our faithful prayer partners, the great honorable Congressman Louis Gomart from Texas. Thank you. This country's in trouble and we do need to humble ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. But let me share very quickly, when George Washington was at Valley Forge with men. You, you know the story. You've seen the painting of Washington on his knee praying. Isaac Potts, whose family had owned that valley, heard that. He was a Quaker. He did not believe that the revolution was appropriate. But in the account Potts' granddaughter wrote, Isaac Potts peered from behind a tree, heard Washington pray, and she said, her father, her grandfather heard him pray aloud, and in his prayer he utterly disclaimed all ability of his own for this arduous conflict. He wept at the thought of that irretrievable ruin which his mistakes might bring on his country. And with the patriots' pathos spreading the interests of unborn millions before the eye of eternal mercy, he implored the aid of that arm which guides the starry hosts. And Isaac Potts said, if that man be not a man of God, then I would be completely wrong. Folks, unless we come to that kind of humility that George Washington shared on his knees praying that millions in the future would not pay for the mistakes of today, 
we're going to lose this greatest gift a people have ever been given. So as the people are praying, please bow your heart, bow your spirit, and pray that God will allow this greatest gift of people have ever been given besides Jesus Christ. Thank you. God bless you. And through you, God can keep blessing America. Thank you very much. We are truly honored and humbled to be standing on this platform speaking to you today in our nation's capital. My name is Matthew Bona, and I stand up here not as a groom and polished man of God, but as a sinner that was once deeply entangled into the bondage of this world. Diseased by lust, lies, addiction, and depression, I thank God that those chains of the enemy have been broken, and it's by the blood of Jesus I've been set free. That testimony begins on Easter Sunday where a miracle took place that forever saved the future of my life and the life of my family. My dad, John Bono, will share with you that special day. Good evening, good evening. You know, it was Easter Sunday, about 12 noon, and literally rays of sunlight streaming from the hand of God that formed two words on the ceiling in our home. It's hard to believe. Immediately, we sensed the room was different. It had a soft light. It was pure, and the words were glowing, like they were branded right on the ceiling. Faith God. That's what it said. Easter Sunday at 12 noon, faith God. Our lives were forever changed. This sinner was saved, a new creation in Christ. Over the years, God led us to do many things. One of those was to be involved in the production of a film called Monumental. You may have heard of this. The story of America's beginning, the Pilgrims and the Forefathers Monument, and her central, the central figure there, her name is Faith. She's 81 feet high, and she's pointing to heaven and holding a Bible. Have you seen it? Well, the same year our Constitution was ratified, we asked a question, why did they build this? Well, they said a powerful rainstorm actually poured into the little village of Plymouth. And on a hill there, just above Plymouth Rock, exploded the remains, the bones, of the pilgrims who were buried in a common grave in 1620. When the people in the village, when they saw the bones, they remembered the sacrifice of the pilgrims and they repented. Like ancient Israel, they decided to build a memorial to the forefathers who founded this nation 400 years ago this year. Our forefathers, they had a formula of success. They established the nation that became the best example of religious, economic, and civil liberty ever known to mankind. Today, unfortunately, we see jobs, business travel deemed unnecessary by the state, healthy people quarantined, St. Augustine called it the lust to dominate. But we always have a choice. The word of God or the whims of man. The Bible or the bayonet. Remove God and you strike at the, at the root of Christianity. And you have tyranny and chaos. There's no way to pansy that. That's why the message of this monument is so important because if acted upon, it would set the tyrants back a long, long time. Underneath this central figure of faith are other symbols, morality, law, and education. Additionally resides liberty, the liberty man. This liberty man, he fights evil if he has to. There's no ceasefire. His his soul finds the freedom, his repentant soul. He's totally opposite. The antithesis of him is the unrepentant man, crushed by his own sinful nature and always losing. This is the battle of the centuries. Will we be slaves or will we be free people? What is it that unchains slaves? What is it that makes free people free? It's any person who resists the powers of slavery. This small group of families, known as the Pilgrims, 
They knew the unchanging, proven strategy to build a free and prosperous nation. They had the treasure, as my friend Marshall Foster says, they had the treasure of America's future greatness, not in chests of gold or in the power of an army, but inside their chests, in their very soul. Scripture tells us about another type of monument, inaugurated by the ancient Hebrews that is the keeper of the past and hope of future generations. Their God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, told them when they entered the Promised Land to build a memorial of remembrance, a monument commemorating the Ark of the Covenant. So the story could be told of how the waters were supernaturally parted, allowing God's chosen people to enter the land on dry ground. We, as Americans, have lost our way. We are wandering in the wilderness. Much like the ancient Hebrew people, we need the landmarks of our fathers to be our compass pointing back to God. A group of people blessed to carry with them miracles and wonders of an all-powerful God who parted seas, defeated armies, or caused the earth to swallow people in their rebellion. They, re they received God's law that was bestowed in lightning, thunder, and awe on Mount Sinai. It was into this nation that our Lord and Savior, Jesus of Nazareth, was born. It was this Jesus who stood in the synagogue and read from the scroll of Isaiah, revealing the good news of salvation. Jesus is not simply a liberty man, he is the liberty man. We who desire to follow his example are but shadows of the one who preached liberty like no one else. Jesus not only spoke of liberty, he laid his life down as a sacrifice for each and every one of us, providing eternal liberty. We were enslaved to sin and hell, but Jesus came to set the captives free. The gospel of Christ has broken the fangs of the enemy and has released its victims from bondage. The King of Kings is undeniable and unstoppable. He will be victorious. As Ronald Reagan said, liberty is not in our bloodstream. It must be taught to every generation. Without revival in this country, the free and prosperous land we all love will be a thing of the past. We must turn back to God. We take great confidence that this government rests on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. He who lifted the centuries off their hinges and split the world into saved and lost, redeemed and unredeemed. So if a person truly believes that Jesus' sacrifice paid on the cross, they can return to him and experience God's love. The incredible love of a father who gave his only begotten son to endure the penalty for your sin. And the love of a son who came to this world knowing that he would be mocked beaten and crucified for you. So if there is some bad habit that'll not let go of you in spite of all your efforts, I know the feeling. You cannot get free. Come to the cross at Calvary. As the great reformer said, God is not unforgiving. He doesn't desire to throw anybody into hell forever. If we truly believe Christ is our savior, we have a God of love. And to see God in faith is to look upon his friendly heart. So when the devil throws your sins in your face and tells you you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit it, I deserve death and hell. What of it? I know the one who suffered and made satisfaction for me. His name is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And where he is, I shall be also. Hallelujah. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. I want to share with you tonight about a movement that God has already begun. A movement called Awakening Arise. A movement where the people cast off the bands of tyranny and embrace liberty. A movement that requires Congress to check activist judges by impeaching them a movement that demands the overturn of Roe v. Wade, a movement where we, the people, awaken and arise. We are here tonight for repentance, but it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It's his goodness that causes us to change the way we think. 
This pursuit of good stands in stark contrast to what we see playing out in our streets in America. We are living in bad days, days of bitterness, anger, and division, and it must stop. We are living in days where socialism is touted as a great good instead of a great evil, and it must stop. We are living in days where our history is no, not only being forgotten, it is being actively erased, and it must stop. We are living in days where governmental tyranny and oppression takes fear and allows it to trample on our freedoms, and it must stop. And we are living almost 50 years under the Holocaust of abortion, and it must stop. Repentance not only causes us to change the way we think, it causes our hearts to align with the heart of God. When the heart of God is infused within the church, we see revival. And when the heart of God is infused within civil government, we see reformation. And when revival is coupled with reformation, we see an awakening that pours over to the people and a nation can be saved in a day. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth, life is good, death is bad. Jesus came that we may have life and life abundantly and the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. The truth, Every baby is created in the womb with an unalienable right to life that cannot be taken from them. The truth, millennials and Gen Z are the most pro-life generation since Roe v. Wade, and the truth is it is time for Roe to be overturned and the blight of abortion wiped off the face of America. We must not shrink back in fear, for we stand on the right side of history. The great atrocities of the past always shock future generations. Those who selfishly cast themselves in a light of higher value than others are forever cast as the villains. But those of us who stand in defense of those who are being dehumanized and brutalized, we are forever cast as the heroes. It has always been such, and it always must be for life has an inherent value, so conquer we must. When our cause, it is just, and this is our motto, in God is our trust. It is time, it is time for you to join the movement and awakening arise. It is time for tyranny to be replaced with liberty. It is time for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. It is time for an awakening to arise. My name is Jim Garlow. And I am Rosemary Schindler Garlow. And we are going to be praying specifically over government. So in the midst of kind of a rainy Friday night, could you focus in your thoughts right now as we pray over governmental officials together. Father, we lift up those in government. We lift up our president and the first lady. We lift up vice president and the second lady. We lift up to you the members of the cabinet, the enormous responsibilities all of these carry. We come to you in their behalf right now. We pray for the 100 members of the U.S. Senate. We pray for the 435 members of the House of Representatives. We ask for an avalanche of truth to be released on the Senate and the House. Father, we pray for the 18,000 staff members, many of the millennials that serve the members of Congress. There could be a revival that could spread and begin even that arena. Lord, we pray for 50 governors. We pray for mayors of cities, that there would be an understanding of what it means to protect the citizenry of their state and their respective cities. We pray for all 511,000 people who will be elected on November the 3rd across this nation. Lord, we would hunger to see a release of biblical truths of governance 
released upon their hearts in an inexplicable way that changes this nation and causes us to return to you in every aspect. I pray for 193 ambassadors at the United Nations and for 193 different nations, their presidents, prime ministers, or king. Lord, release a global revival, we pray. And we repent over national sins, be it that of the abuse of Native Americans or slavery and Jim Crow or the murder and slaughter of babies in the womb or the destruction of the definition of marriage or anti-Semitism. Father, we come in the spirit of repentance this day asking forgiveness for our national sins. And Father, we're so privileged to be here at the right place, our nation's capital, at the right time, at the Shabbat of Teshuva when we are to return to you and we repent to you first of all, Lord, we listen, that we would listen to you and hear your word. I repent to you as an American for breaking, for violating covenant with you, for we have covenantal biblical governance, Father, and we have not acknowledged you as the head of our nation. We have not listened to your decrees or followed your admonitions, Father. Father, I, I repent before you for turning away from your laws, your pre precepts, your direction, your way, and your wisdom. I repent for leaving you out of our decision-making in government where you are the source of all truth and justice and righteousness. I ask you to forgive us for going our, our own way and abandoning yours and for all the sins that have come upon us because we are lost and we have been a rebellious people. I ask you to forgive, forgive us, Father, in this time when you are listening in your courts where we have access to your great mercy, that you would pour it out upon us and once again lead us into your presence and revival. In the name of our Messiah, Yeshua, amen. Day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. He's the reason we're here. You're the reason we're here. Yes, Jesus, you're the reason we're sick.
Would you make that your prayer tonight? Sing, show up. Yeah, show us. Would you show us your glory, Lord? Show us. Show us your power. spoke to the people in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. See, I have taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Observe them carefully for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations who will hear about all these decrees and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. The brilliant Andrew Breitbart said politics is downstream of culture, which begs the question, who runs the culture? Well, that would be Hollywood and the mainstream media, of course. What we feed our brains as entertainment is often what manifests in the real world, and we've witnessed that happening more and more in an ever-changing, angry, and hate-filled world. And the culture these days, quite frankly, is going down the toilet. So what can we do about that? Scripture teaches us to take no part in unfruitful works of darkness but to expose them. I've been in the movie and television business now for 35 years, and I've seen the impacts of both good and bad filmmaking. Walt Disney said, storytelling is the way to change the world. Movies can and do have tremendous influence in shaping young lives. Well, his successors and their peers have certainly exemplified this, feverishly creating a new normal while many of us sit idly by and do absolutely nothing. We have a war to fight, and I hate to say it, but right now we are losing that war. Funny thing is, people are very hungry for wholesome content to watch with their families and just for themselves. People want uplifting and inspiring stories. People used to stop me all the time about my series Hercules or Andromeda, but that has shifted. Now when I walk around, people stop me and say, please make more movies, like what if God's not dead and let there be light. Let There Be Light, a $2.3 million movie, opened the same weekend that Thor Ragnarok, a $200 million movie, opened, and we had virtually no budget to promote Let There Be Light, yet we opened number two in the box office. And the only way that could happen, the only way that could happen, is that we would be able to compete with your support and strong word of mouth. Friends, we need your help. We need the church, we need the church body to move to support the culture you desire. Do not hide your light under bushel, but raise it high to lead the nation. We need more principled filmmakers and storytellers who can weave moral fabric back into our culture. We need to compete in the marketplace of influence in a positive way and shout truth from the mountaintops. For too long, Christians have retreated from the culture under the banner and fear of political correctness. We talk a good fight in the comfort of our homes and among the circle of like-minded friends, but we hide when confronted in public. And unfortunately, conservatives and Christians are often disparaged by Hollywood, or worse, they're won over to the darker side of things. We've also been beaten down by the mainstream media, and it is time to stand up and fight back. I am so... I am so sick and tired of hearing about the new normal because there's nothing normal about it. 
We cannot let them keep rewriting the Constitution and changing the definitions of words. And by the way, you were going to lose your friends when you step into that battle, but I'll tell you what, they never were your friends in the first place. Proclaim the gospel without fear, regardless of consequences. This country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. Our Constitution, our laws, were forged from the words of the Bible. And whether you like it or not, you've all been drafted into this fight. Why? Because you see the direction this country needs to go, and more importantly, that you care. I want to thank you all for being loyal soldiers for Christ, and I'm so grateful to have you all on board. I am Kevin Sorbo, and I approve this message. God bless. Good evening. My name is Marco Lairdini. I'm honored to be here tonight. What an incredible moment in history we have before us. On the eve of the return a solemn assembly when we're called back to return to God, there is a remnant gathering in D.C. and around the world. Generations are coming together to repent, but also to awaken and arise, to unite and to rebuild. Awaken and arise. It reminds me of the story in Ezekiel when he looked out, when the Lord showed him the valley of the dry bones. We see the same thing today in our culture. We see the same thing where dreams and hopes have died. But what he did is he prophesied to the wind and he prophesied to the bones. And what happened? An exceeding great army arose, an army of kings arising to unite for a purpose, to unite, as it says in Psalms 112, to become a generation of the upright, a generation that is united in purpose, a generation that has come to gather to make a difference. A generation that is not defined by age or when they were born, but they have been born again into one family. It is Gen U, the generation of the upright. A generation where the older, those that have gone before, the fathers and the mothers of the faith, are open to hear new ideas and wisdom and strategy from the younger generation and the younger generation that is willing to take their place to listen to the wisdom from the older generation, from the fathers and the mothers of faith. It is time to rebuild. Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? And when he responded with an understanding, his name was changed. He became the next generation. Jesus said that on this rock of revelation, I will build my ecclesia, my legislative body, not a church building, not a man's kingdom, but a legislative body to make a difference in the world. It's a time now which is very similar to the time when Nehemiah rose and saw the the status of his nation. Gates were burnt, the walls were torn down and destroyed. But Nehemiah had a message. Nehemiah, the next generation that we are representing, has the same message. He said that God has called us to build this, to arise, and he will give us success. And of course, in any building, it takes one hand to build and the other to have a sword and be prepared to fight. It's time now 
It is time now to awaken and, and arise and rebuild. And we will say to the enemy that God has called us for this time and he will give us success. But as for those who try to fight against us, you will have no rights or inheritance a memorial. It is time to pray. Let the dry bones awaken and we prophesy to the wind and we prophesy to the bones. It's the time for the next generation, exceedingly great army to arise. It is time to unite, rebuild as one nation, serving one king, building one kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, my name is Luis Torres, and I came here to tell you that God is a God of miracles, He's a God of life, and He's a God of power, and He's a God of deliverance. In 1970, I walked into the doors of Teen Challenge Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, out of Holmesburg Prison. I was facing 15 to 35 years in the penitentiary. I was born in Puerto Rico, raised in New York City and Philadelphia. And at age 15 years old, I began to experiment with drugs, marijuana, alcohol, meth, and finally heroin. I became an addict and a pawn of the devil's hand with heroin. I stole from my family. I broke into people's homes to support my drug habit that cost me $3,000 a month. In five years, I stole 250 cars. I got so good at stealing, I could steal a radio and leave the music behind. <laughs> my addiction cost me my life, my medication. It cost me my education. My family disowned me. And I was totally distraught with my life. I was charged with seven felonies, facing time in prison. And while I was sitting in prison awaiting trial, my sister called the Philadelphia Teen Challenge Center after she heard a guy by the name of Nikki Cruz in a Philadelphia church giving his testimony. And she said, if God can change Nikki Cruz, God can change Luis Torres and anybody. So on October 7, 1970, I was released by a judicial error in the courts of Philadelphia, and I ended up in the front doors of Teen Challenge. And when I knocked on the door, the preacher that came to the jail opened the door and said, we've been expecting you. On October the 11th, in a little church in Medford, New Jersey, I got on my knees and I asked Jesus Christ to change my life. He took this heart of stone, he took the dirty hypodermic needle mentality from my mind, wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and said from this day on, Lewis, you're the head and not the tail. You're blessed going in and you're blessed going out and no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I graduated the program, got called into the ministry, met a beautiful girl in Oklahoma, married her, got some children. I have a son and I'm very proud to say that he's a first lieutenant, a logistics elevation officer, aviation officer in the United States Marine. And I want to tell those of you that are watching, that are listening, grandmother, grandfather, mom and dad, God can change your children. God can give you a miracle. There's not a medicine on the face of this earth that can cure a drug addicted person, but it's in the cleansing fountain of the blood of Jesus Christ. And God took this nobody and made a somebody out of this nobody. And now this nobody is telling everybody about somebody who can change anybody. God bless you, Washington, D.C. God bless you, America. We love you. Hallelujah. Are you just enjoying this tonight? And the best is ready to come now. We have some special guests here tonight. We have the famed evangelist and a wonderful, precious man of God, Nikki Cruz. 
We have a wonderful man who all of us know, who played David Wilkerson in the movie, The Cross and the Switchblade, Nikki's good friend, Pat Boone. And we have a global leader from Teen Challenge who has a great testimony. Please welcome for the next two minutes these three great men of God coming together. Hallelujah! Somebody shout hallelujah! He's breaking chains! 60 years ago, a country preacher heard God say, sell your TV and spend more time in prayer. When he looked down at the Life magazine, he saw a very racially charged trial, a brutal teen gang murder for the Egyptian kings, and God gave him a word, go help those boys. Well, he wasn't able to help those boys, but on the street, he encountered the Mau Mau's, a notoriously violent crime a gang, and he met Nicky Cruz. When Nicky met him, he took his knife and he said, I will cut you. David Wilkerson said, if you cut me in a million pieces, every piece will cry out from the street, Mickey, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you tonight. Did you know today that every minute, eight people die of addiction? That's 420 every hour. That's 10,800 every day. That's 3 million every year. But the power of Jesus Christ can change all of that. And they are living testimonies of that power. COVID is a terrible thing. But for every person that dies of COVID, three will die of addiction. Will you pray with us as Brother Nikki and Brother Pat bring this word tonight that Jesus will set the captives free. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Listen, good evening, everybody. God bless you all. This uh, is quite a moment for the two of us because we're just talking about how long ago we made that movie and, and how uh, exciting it was to be literally in the streets of Harlem and Brooklyn, Fort Greene, the Bronx, where that story took place and reenacting it and uh, I remember when we were, uh, I got in a cab from downtown Manhattan to come up to the site where we were going to be shooting our main scenes together. And, uh, and so the cabbie said, what are you going up to Harlem for? I said, we're making a movie in the streets. He says, you got to be crazy. <laughs> and I'm going to pull up to the sidewalk and let you out. You pay me before we get there. I'm gone. That's how dangerous it was. Well, we were actually reliving the life of Dave Wilkerson and, uh, and uh, you. <laughs> and, and as Eric Estrada was playing you. And <laughs> how, how many times you got slapped on your face? Well, well, you know, when he, he, had to, he had to say that about cutting me up as Dave Wilkerson. And I said, if you can do it, but you can cut me into a hundred pieces and every piece will be saying, God loves you. And he slapped me as you apparently had slapped Wilkerson. Yes. And I didn't know it, but Dave Wilkerson was standing in the back as, as we were filming this. Well, Nikki, I mean, Eric Estrada had never acted before. And he kept slapping me hard. <laughs> that in, was the first time. In the rehearsals and then in the real thing, and my teeth were getting loose. And, uh, and, I, and the director, Don Murray, said, hey, ease up, ease up until we're actually shooting the scene. But I survived. And, and Nikki, uh, you and I, you were, you were the garbage can killer. That's what they called you. You were actually, you were deep into demonic activity, weren't you? That's correct. And I want to hear from you. We're gonna, I'm going to step aside and let you talk in a minute. But we were both so privileged. To, uh, to be part of that movie, and, and they've just been telling us backstage, well, you told me how many millions of people. Uh, uh, two, uh, two million, five hundred thousand. More than that, I think it's more like 200 million. Two, 200, I'm 200 sorry. million, yes. Sounds like Joe Biden. No, I'm concerned. I'm cons <laughs> In reverse. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but yes, God used the two of us 
And, and listen, I want to tell you before he speaks that I consider him a Puerto Rican Apostle Paul. This man has reached so many people, literally by the hundreds of thousands in person, coming from a very poor background. And then after he met Jesus, well, I'll let him tell you, but I, I so admire and love this man, and I'm happy to hand the mic to the real Nikki Cruz. Thank you, Pat. God bless you. It's good to be here. I just want to go ahead straight to, to my life. I was born in Puerto Rico. Raised in New York City, educated in California, and confused in Colorado Spring, Colorado. But one thing I, I have to say, that God has been so good to me and to my family, my wife, my daughters, my grandchildren. They have come from a curse into the highest majestic presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I was born in Puerto Rico, I didn't know nothing. The only thing I knew was the abuse. Many times, why did my mother went after my, my life, kick me, and many times I was breathing so heavily from my nose, split my lips, kick me in my stomach until I fall unconscious on the floor, drag me to this room, it was dark, and there I was breathing so bad that I, that I didn't have no energy. And every time that I called my mother to give me a glass of water or give me some food, I heard her say, you are son of the devil. My mother was very deeply involved in black magic. My father was a satanic priest. And here was the environment. I wasn't the only one who was in the family. By the way, you're going to get surprised. I have 17 brothers and one sister. So my father really got it. He really got lots of love. But today, as I standing here, I began to flash back and say, is it something that is hard to explain? The thing that happened to me, it was that my mother beat me so much that I tried to commit suicide and hanging when I was nine years old, right there in a mango tree. And from there, things began to change. My mother told me right in my face and beat me up and told me, you are not my son. Get out of my face. I never want to see you again. You are a failure. You are son of Satan. I curse the day that I brought you into this world. This is my mother talking. This is my mother cursing me. And then that did it. That completely damaged me mentally, emotionally, physically. That the only alternative that I have it was to kill myself. What the heck I'm doing in this world? If this is, it's better to be dead that to be abused, it better to know that, that there's nothing. I'm a failure. I'm, I'm no good for nothing. When you hear those words, that hurt. That hurt. And my life from there, I die. I died when I was nine years old. And I was waiting to be buried when I was 19 or 20 years old, right? in a lonely street in Brooklyn, New York. And through all of these things, all what I did, I did a lot of things wrong. My hand was full of blood. I saw people die. I saw my best friend die on, on, right in my arms. And there, no more, no more money. Gone, history. And I knew that he was 17 years old. And I was hugging him. He was already dead 
32 staff on his chest. And I had to see this. And then after that, I was going wild in the street. New York City was like a jungle. In the jungle, there's so much thing that happen. An animal don't know the difference between right and wrong. The animal had to kill another animal so he can survive. So that was happened to me. Yes, my hand was full of blood. Yes, I received a lot of joy in hurting people because I was possessed with, with this anger and bitterness. Torn apart, and here I was in and out of yell. And yes, the last time there is, because when I was in the last time in jail, I was put in, in this cell away from all, all the other people. And then from there, I began to feel a lot of things. My mind, I smoked my mind, and I began to talk to myself, just smoking a cigarette. As I smoked my mind, they already say, if you a man, why you behave like an animal? If you were an animal, how in the world you behave like a human being? There was no answer. But I remember when I was released. I remember when I was dealing with a psychiatrist for six months. And then Dr. Goodman told me, Nikki, there's a dark side in you that nobody can penetrate. You are walking straight to jail on the electric chair, Nikki. You are dead. And then it happened. Out of the blue sky, this man came in with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, you're expecting to see Hercules. You're expecting to see somebody strong. No, he was a hillbilly, a hick. This guy, this, he, the suit that he had, he got a black suit, a white shirt, tiny, tiny tie. And then he was so skinny, 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 like a spaghetti. That was the man that God brought into my life. I hear this man some way, somehow, penetrate the war zone. And there he came to be abused, to be misused to be cursed, to be in a way that we stole everything that he had, walking in the street without no shoes. He didn't give up, like many people give up. He was still there. And yet I went to hear this man, but I didn't went by myself. I took 75 guys for protection. And we this. We was going wild. And there's another 12 gangs. Wilkerson was naive. He invited 12 different gangs enemy. And we was known by one of the worst gangs in New York City. We fought all, all the, the gangs and not only that, but we declared war against the police because there was a boy that was killed but you know when you're a criminal, you cannot escape, you got to lie, you become a good liar, and I became a good liar. And then I, I, I tried to, to say to myself, I'm a good man. No, I wasn't a good man at all. But then this guy, David Wilkerson, came in. I was with my girlfriend about three blocks down, and I heard this voice, a loud voice. And then I told my girl, come on, let's go. Because we used to have signal, you know. When I said, you come, you come, you understand? And all of these things that you do. And then my girl didn't want to come. So I told her, when I said, you come, you come, you understand? And then I don't have to say anything else. We start running together. There was about 300 people there. I heard this guy say, God had the power to change your life right now. And then when I heard that, I said, you shut up. There's no God. We are the people. We got the power. And nobody can come and penetrate us. 
So get out of this neighborhood. Then I started pushing the people. I want to see this guy. I want to see it. Then I just went and I pushed the people face to face with David. And I said, you, 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 skinny. What you doing here? Then I slap him. I spit at him. I curse him with every X word that you can find in the, in the dirty vocabulary. And then let me say this. Then Wilkerson froze. When he froze, you can tell because I was a streetwise. This guy, he can talk. Then just like that, he opened his mouth and he said, I came over here, Nikki, to bring you a message from heaven. Nikki, Jesus loves you. And I just look at him and say, what's the matter with this guy? Then not only that, I push him and here he starts screaming at me. Kill me. Is that going to make you feel good? Kill me in front of these people. I know you can do it. Do it. And, th and I say, wow. Whoa. This guy is a, it's a spooky. It's a, it's a stranger. Nobody told me to kill him. So he said, you go ahead. You can kill me in thousand pieces. And you can throw those pieces right there on the, on the street. But remember, Nikki, every little piece is going, going to cry out, Jesus love you, Nikki. And that was the thing that really changed the atmosphere. He got through my head. Do you know that? Everything, Jesus love you, Jesus love you, Jesus love you. For two weeks, Jesus love you, Jesus love you. I was sleeping here with my girl, Jesus love you, Jesus love you, walking the street, committing all kinds of hold up, Jesus love you, Jesus love you, fighting with the other gangs, and you go all the way out, and there's no guarantee that you're gonna come out, what you call a rumble. And then, I went to heal the preacher. And ladies and gentlemen, what a surprise. We walk in, there were 2,000 people there, 12 different gangs, and here I walk in, we interrupt the whole service. This poor girl tried to sing the song, she was beautiful, and we say, here baby, here, here, you can smoke this, and you can smoke this, and you can sing better. And then the poor girl didn't know what to do. She dropped the microphone, Wilkerson grabbed the microphone, and then, just like that, he started crying and crying. I said, what that guy doing, crying? Like a girl? You're not supposed to cry in front of people. But who knows the compassion inside of a, in a woman or a man? Well, let me tell you, that night, something beautiful happened. I wasn't expected. Then it seemed that the other gangs wanted to fight us. We were ready for the fight. And some way, somehow, God intervened. He helped David Wilkerson. And right there, he just said that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And he died for you. And it takes a lot of heart for anybody to give your life to Christ. And then I was thinking, wow, I never heard about Jesus Christ at all. And perhaps some of you, 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 you might be questioned if God is for real or this is happened or not happened. But that night, that night, I, I went and I remember very clear that when I went, I wasn't expecting this. My knees were shaking. There's something there, and like a rush wind came in. And that night, I wasn't expecting this. I fall on my knees. Nobody put me down. I went on my, my knees by myself. And I tell you this, 
I wasn't expecting. That, then I began to flash back. This is impossible. This is hate. I don't believe in this. What I'm doing. And I saw my friend Israel crying. And I said, what are you doing crying? And then I was the one that just began to feel something tight my heart. I could not breathe. I went to my knees. And right there, there is Jesus Christ came into my heart. Jesus Christ totally changed me. That night, he showed me his love. He died for me. And I didn't know who Jesus Christ was. But you can never walk out from the presence of the Lord. You can never be that tough. Because he handled every tough circumstances. Every situation. And I went and I say, I don't know how to love. I don't know. I'm full of hate. Uh, help me, Jesus, for the first time. And I started screaming in front of my girlfriend and the other guys that came with me to give their heart to Jesus. And I just crying and crying. And there is. I say, if you really love me, help me. Help me, please. I don't know what is going on. And that day, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I surrendered myself. I repent for my sin and ask him to forgive me. And he did it. And you think, wow, yes, he did it. Because I changed my weapon for a Bible. And that day that I took my Bible, I never went back. I'm looking forward for the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking forward to bring that person to Jesus Christ. And he's going to do it. I'm going to leave you with this. I have been all over the world. I have spoke to millions of people. This guy with a... With, can you tell that I, got, that I have an accent? What are you laughing at? A sexy, sexy yeah. accent. I gave my life to Christ. And you know what Christ did? That he broke that curse of witchcraft completely. My mother gave her heart to Jesus Christ. She's in heaven with Jesus. My father gave his heart to Jesus. Cursed the darkness and receive the light. 13 of my brothers gave their heart to Jesus. Three became ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm standing here knowing where I'm going, knowing what Christ has done. There's no way I've got one way to go, one ticket, not two ways, one ticket. And now I'm going to do something. If Jesus changed Nicky Cruz, he can change you too. And I want you to know, right now, I cannot see you, the last of people here. But so what? Some of you, you need Jesus. You need forgiveness. You need to forgive yourself for all the things that you have done. And you need help. And Jesus Christ can help you. He can heal your heart. He can kiss your pains away like he did to me. He will come if you call him right now. I don't see you, but in this moment, if you have been touched and you say, God, if you, if you touch Nikki, please help me. Touch me. I need help. I want you to raise your hands, whatever you are, regardless if I don't see you. And some of the sisters or brother will put their arms around you with love. And you release yourself totally to Jesus Christ. Take the Bible in your hands and believe that Jesus can do it. Okay? 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 Jesus Christ 
every time to all the things that we're going to fears and everything run to the cross run to Jesus he's gonna receive you with open arms and he will kiss your pain and help you with your fear can you do that let me say this prayer for you sweet Jesus of the Bible oh you are so beautiful you had the power to change life. You got it. That is the mystery. That you are the Savior that came from heaven for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him shall never perish or have everlasting life. Thank you for the power of the word and thank you for what you have done. Touch everyone here, the family, the drug addicts that are hurting so bad. Family right now, they don't know what to do. Let me tell you, there's a one way that you can go. Go, run into the arm of Jesus Christ and surrender. Enough is enough. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. En español. Perdóname, Señor Jesús. Perdóname. Help me. Ayúdame. I need you. Te necesito. Ven. Entra en mi corazón. Come. Enter into my heart. And take it into your hands. And kiss my heart with so much bitterness and hate. I surrender right now. I surrender. Raise your hands and say, I surrender right now. God is for real. I am for real. Pat Booney for real. Everyone here is for real. And because Jesus Christ has changed you and changed me. And those who know, don't know Jesus Christ, come and he will help you. It is my prayer. God bless you. Take care. I don't see you, but I can feel you, okay? God bless you. Amen, what a powerful word. Are you all excited about Jesus? Come on, we're coming back to our first love. Amen. You know, Jesus said that the greatest commandment was to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is the whole purpose why we're here. This is the reason why we stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters. Come on. I've been running in circles, jumping the hurdles. Getting caught in that brush and doing so much Feeling kind of worn out All this checking the boxes Trying to be thoughtless Got me spinning my head, catching my breath Too afraid to slow down I tell myself, keep this up That God wants more than just my love I've been complicating things It's just like me to overthink Gotta keep it real simple, keep it real simple Bring everything right back to ground zero Cause it all comes down to this Love God and love people Living in a world that keeps breaking If we wanna find a way to change it It all comes down to this Love God and love people All this is freedom And it's keys to the kingdom Life can be found, but love can be life Cause love is what it's all about I tell myself to keep this up That all God wants is just my love No more complicated things No more need to overthink Gotta keep it real simple, keep it real simple Bring everything right back to ground zero Cause it all
love is patient, love is kind It rescues hearts and changes lives Love is all we need to make things right Yes, I'll see the sense in Welcome back to the stage, Mr. Kevin Jessup. Hallelujah. Can we all just give the Lord Jesus Christ one last hat, hand clap tonight? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. He's still on the throne. You know, recently I got back from Israel, and guess what? The tomb is still empty. Hallelujah. Tomorrow morning, I just want to invite all of you back. At 9 a.m., get here early. We're expecting some special things, and it's going to be a day to remember for the turning of this nation back to God. We're coming with repentive hearts. We're coming with contrite spirits. We're coming to bow before God. So join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., all the way through 9 p.m. tomorrow. Be ready for a God-filled day and thank the Lord for all of you who are standing as an army of believers to turn this nation. And we thank you tonight. Come back tomorrow at 9 a.m. God bless all of you. Really work in about a half minute that we have left. Yeah, hard to say if they really work. I mean, look, I think the train has left the station with President Trump as it relates to evangelicals and the pro-life community. I mean, he's done so much for them. Anyhow, uh, one more isn't really going to make too much of a difference. As for the, the, the black community, that might be a bit of a different story. I mean, you know, the, the Trump campaign won 9 percent of the African-American vote. They're trying to get to 13, 14 percent. It could hurt Joe Biden, some key swing states. So that could be instrumental. And by the way, speaking of this uh, uh, plan that you're talking about, uh, the platinum plan. One of the things in there is that the KKK would be uh, denounced, or excuse me, uh, right. labeled as a terrorist group. That is part of the platinum plan, and That's that right. will mm -hmm. throw the media into a bit of a tailspin.